Welcome. I'd really appreciate if you could drop a comment with your thoughts and reactions as you listen. Your feedback helps me craft better stories for you. Day 1. The dead have risen. I watch in horror from my bedroom window as Mr. and Mrs. Johnson stagger aimlessly down the street. Their movements are unnaturally stiff and jerky. Mrs. Johnson lurches toward little Timmy next door, grabbing his arm in an iron grip. He screams as she pulls him close, snapping at his neck with rotting teeth. I slam my window shut, my heart pounding. This can't be real. It has to be a nightmare. I pinch myself hard, but the scene outside refuses to fade. Dark shapes shuffle along the sidewalk, moaning low in their throats. One of them spots me through the glass and stumbles over, its milky eyes fixed on my face. I stifle a scream and duck out of sight. Its gnarled fingers scrabble uselessly at the window pane. A guttural growl rises from its throat. I back away slowly, my legs trembling. This is really happening. The dead have risen, and they're hunting the living. I lock my front door with shaking hands and slide the security chain into place, praying it will keep them out. My parents are away on a business trip. I'm alone in this big empty house as the world outside descends into chaos. I curl up in my bed, pulling the blankets over my head, but I can still hear them out there an endless chorus of moans and cries that pierce the darkness. I must have dozed off from exhaustion at some point. When I wake, the noises have faded, but an eerie silence hangs over the neighborhood. I peek outside cautiously. The street is deserted, littered with abandoned cars and shreds of clothing. No sign of my neighbors, dead or alive. The power is out. I fumble around in the dark for a flashlight and head downstairs on unsteady legs. The air is stale. I throw open the back door to let in some fresh air and am greeted by a sickly sweet smell that makes my stomach churn. A shape detaches itself from the shadows of the backyard. I stifle a scream as milky eyes fix on me hungrily. It used to be Mrs. Wilson from next door. Now it's just a shambling corpse, decayed flesh sloughing off bone. It shuffles toward me with outstretched arms. I slam the door shut and bolt it frantically. Its gnarled fingers claw at the wood as guttural moans vibrate through the door. I stumble away, heart pounding. This is real. The dead have risen and they're hunting the living. I'm trapped in this house with no power and dwindling supplies, surrounded by the walking dead. God help us all. Day 2. I barely slept, starting at every creak and groan of the old house. Nightmares of rotting hands dragging me into the darkness kept waking me with a gasp. The constant moans outside didn't help either. As dawn's pale light filtered in, I crept to the windows cautiously. The street was empty again, but I knew they were out there, shambling through the neighborhood like lost souls. My stomach rumbled loudly but I was too afraid to venture downstairs yet. Instead, I rummaged through my closet for supplies. A half-full backpack, some granola bars, and bottled water. Not enough to last long if things got worse. I needed to know what was happening in the outside world. My phone was dead, so I risked turning on the generator for a few minutes to charge it and scan for any emergency broadcasts. Static greeted me on every channel. That's when I found the messages. Do not leave your homes. Stay inside in Bari. Cut off. Dead rising. Military evacuation zones. Nothing but fragments that raised more questions than answers. A crash from downstairs jolted me from the phone. I froze, listening intently. Slow, heavy footsteps shuffled across the kitchen tile. My blood ran cold. One of them was inside. I peered down the stairwell with the flashlight. Hands shaking, a hulking shape was rifling through the pantry, letting cans and boxes spill to the floor. It must have smelled the generator and been drawn here. As I watched, it straightened up with a grunt. Half its face was missing, exposing yellowed bone. It fixed milky eyes on the stairs and started lurching toward me. 
I slammed the door and threw the lock just as its gnarled fingers scrabbled at the wood. Thumps and moans vibrated through the door as it tried to get to me. I backed away, heart in my throat. This place wasn't safe anymore. I had to get out, but where could I go that was safer than being trapped in a house with the dead? Day 3 Night fell, and with it an eerie silence fell over the neighborhood. The constant moaning had faded away, leaving me alone with my thoughts in the dark. I sat huddled in the corner of my room, flashlight in hand, listening for any sounds from downstairs, but all I heard was the pounding of my own heart. Sleep was fitful and restless. Nightmares of rotting hands dragging me into darkness kept waking me with a gasp. Each time, I would startle awake, clutching my flashlight like a weapon, scanning the shadows for any sign of movement. But the room remained empty. Morning light brought no comfort or reassurance. I crept to the window cautiously, peering out at the desolate street below. A few abandoned cars sat in driveways, doors hanging open as if their owners had fled in a panic, leaving valuables and even family behind. But there was no sign of life, human or otherwise. The neighborhood had an eerie, post-apocalyptic feel to it now. My stomach rumbled loudly, reminding me that my meager supplies were dwindling fast. I had to venture downstairs at some point for a more thorough search of the pantry and kitchen. Gripping my flashlight tightly, I unlocked the bedroom door with a shaking hand and peered out into the silent hallway. Taking a deep breath, I stepped out. The lower level seemed deserted at first glance. I made my way to the kitchen on light feet, flashlight beam probing every shadowy corner. The back door stood ajar where I had left it two nights ago. I shut and bolted it firmly, feeling slightly more secure. A quick search of the pantry and cabinets turned up some canned goods, a half-full bag of rice and a few bottles of water. Not a bountiful haul but it would keep me going for a little while longer if I rationed it carefully. I was just sealing up the rice when I heard it, a faint scraping sound from the living room. My blood ran cold and I froze, not daring to breathe, every nerve on high alert. Please, let it have just been the house settling. But then I heard it again, louder this time, a dragging, shuffling gait accompanied by low grunts and moans. My heart leapt into my throat. It was in here with me. Day 4 The noises were getting louder, closer. I backed away slowly, flashlight beam dancing around the living room entrance. Any second, it would appear in the doorway. Where could I hide? There was no way past it to the stairs. I spun around, eyes landing on the pantry, heart pounding. I darted inside and pulled the door almost closed, leaving a narrow gap to see through. Seconds later, it shuffled into view. My breath caught in my throat. It was Mr. Wilson from next door, or what remained of him, pale, bloated flesh slobbing off yellowed bone. One milky eye dangled from its socket on a gristle of nerve. It dragged one leg behind it, the bone protruding through a mass of decay. It threw back its head and let out an ear, splitting howl that sent a chill down my spine. I clamped a hand over my mouth to stifle a scream. It shuffled around blindly, drawn by some primal sense. Any moment, its roaming hands would find the pantry door. I had to get past it, but how? I scanned the kitchen desperately for a weapon. A frying pan lay on the counter. It would have to do. Gripping the pan tightly, I took a deep breath to steady my nerves. Then I flung the pantry door open with a crash. Mr. Wilson spun around with a snarl. I swung with all my might, connecting with the side of its skull with a sickening crunch. It staggered, but didn't go down. I swung again and again until it collapsed in a heap. Still, it twitched and grasped, that milky eye rolling madly. I brought the pan down one last time, pulping its skull. Only then did it fall still. My hands shook violently as I dropped the bloody pan. I had to get out of here before more were drawn by the noise. Shouldering my pack, I fled through the back door into the overgrown backyard. 
The high fence offered no escape. I would have to climb. Brambles tore at my clothes as I hauled myself over and dropped down on the other side, twisting my ankle on impact. Pain shot up my leg, but I bit back a cry and limped away as fast as I could. The neighborhood was eerily silent as I picked my way through overgrown yards and alleyways. No signs of life anywhere, just abandoned cars and the remains of hurried evacuations. But I knew they were out there, shambling through the ruins, hunting by some primal instinct. Night fell, and with it, the temperature dropped sharply. I needed shelter, but where? The houses all seemed empty tombs now. Then I spotted lights in the distance, flickering beyond the tree line. A campfire. Hope flared in my chest. Other survivors. I hurried toward the glow as quickly as my injured ankle allowed. Crashing through the undergrowth, I burst into a small clearing. But it wasn't survivors around that fire. A dozen or more of those things milled about aimlessly, drawn by the light and heat. One spotted me and let out an ear, splitting howl. Suddenly, all their milky eyes fixed on me hungrily. I spun and fled as the horde lurched after me with outstretched hands. Brambles tore at my clothes and branches whipped my face. I had to lose them in the trees. But then my ankle gave out on a root, sending me sprawling on the damp earth. Cold fingers closed around my ankle before I could scramble up. I kicked and thrashed as it started dragging me back with nauseating strength. In a panic, I groped around for a weapon and my hand closed around a fallen branch. With a wordless scream, I brought the branch down on its decaying skull again and again until the fingers slackened. Panting, I hauled myself to my feet, just as the rest of the horde emerged from the trees. There was no escaping this time. Heart in my throat, I turned to face my fate. Day 5 The dead shuffled ever closer, moaning hungrily. As the first one lunged at me with outstretched hands, a shot rang out exploding its skull in a shower of gore. Then another took one cleanly between the eyes. The horde froze, confused by this new threat. A figure emerged from the trees, rifle leveled. Run, a gruff voice shouted. I didn't need telling twice. Ignoring the pain in my ankle, I pelted past the horde as more shots rang out. When I glanced back, only a few stragglers remained. My savior dispatched them quickly and jogged over. Up close, he looked more like a feral survivor than a good Samaritan. A ragged beard and hollow eyes spoke of endless hardship. You okay, girl? I nodded shakily. Thank you for saving me. I thought for sure I was dead. He regarded me coolly. You're welcome. Name's Frank. What are you doing out here alone? trying to find other survivors. My name is Emma. I winced as I tried to put weight on my ankle. Frank's eyes narrowed. You hurt that? At my nod, he sighed. Come on, you can rest up at my camp for now. But you watch yourself. You hear, can't be too careful who to trust these days. I followed him warily through the trees, leaning on a sturdy branch. His camp was small but well fortified, nestled in a rocky ravine. A fire crackled merrily and several dead lay piled to one side, bullet holes in their skulls. Frank lowered me by the fire and rummaged for bandages. Stay off that ankle as long as you can. Don't want it seizing up on you out here. His gruff manner hid kindness, it seemed. I offered a small smile. Thank you for your help, Frank. It's reassuring not to be alone anymore. He grunted noncommittally. But as night fell and the dead moaned in the distance, drawing closer to our firelight, I felt safer here than I had in days. For now, this stranger's camp was my best chance of survival. I could only hope his protection came without strings attached. The future was as uncertain as ever in this new, terrifying world. Day 6 I slept fitfully by Frank's fire, starting at every crackle and pop. Nightmares of rotting hands dragging me into the woods kept waking me into the woods, kept waking me with a gasp. 
Each time, Frank would be there, stoking the flames with a rifle across his lap, watching the tree line intently. Morning light brought little comfort. My ankle was swollen badly, making walking in agony. Frank redressed it gruffly, but his touch was gentle. Keep it elevated. Should go down in a couple days if you rest. I nodded gratefully. His gruff manner hit a kindness, it seemed. As he went to check his traps, I took in the camp more fully. It was well stocked but sparsely furnished. Just the essentials for survival. A tattered notebook caught my eye. Flipping through, I found page after page of names crossed out with dates. Survivors he'd come across, I realized with a chill. Most had short lifespans marked beside them. See something you like? Frank's voice made me jump. He loomed over me, eyes hard. I stammered. I... I'm sorry. I was just looking. Thank you for letting me stay. He grunted and tossed me a can of beans. Eat up. Got a long walk ahead of us. Soon as that ankle's better. A walk. Where are we going? Frank speared beans with his knife, regarding me coolly. Safer place I know of. Few others hold up there too. But it's a few days hike and I ain't carrying you. I suppressed a shudder at the thought of that long trek through woods crawling with the dead. But what choice did I have but to trust this stranger? At least in numbers our chances of survival were better. I could only hope Frank's camp was truly the safer option he claimed. That night, the dead came closer than ever, drawn by our fire. Their moans carried on the night air, sending chills down my spine. I watched their shambling silhouettes through the trees, trying to discern shapes in the darkness. Beside me, Frank cleaned his rifle with methodical precision, eyes never leaving the tree line. Don't you worry none. Ain't nothing getting past old Betsy. He patted the gun affectionately. I offered a weak smile, trying to ignore the nausea in my gut. Being dependent on this man's protection was unnerving. But for now, he was my best chance of surviving another night in this new, terrifying world. Day 7 My ankle was improving slowly, but every step still sent shooting pains up my leg. Frank showed little patience for weakness, pushing me to walk further each day. Gotta build that strength back up, he grunt. World out here ain't waiting for no one. I knew he was right, but it was exhausting. By midday, I was limping badly again and had to rest in the shade. Frank watched me coolly as he cleaned his rifle. We make camp here tonight. Give that ankle another day. His tone allowed no argument. I nodded gratefully and leaned back, closing my eyes. The woods were eerily quiet, but for birdsong. It was easy to forget the horrors that now stalked these trees. A rustling in the brush jolted me awake. Frank had his rifle up in an instant. Eyes narrowed. Slowly, a doe emerged, followed by a spotted fawn. They picked their way daintily toward a small stream. Frank took aim carefully. The shot cracked out, and the doe dropped where it stood. Fresh meat, he grunted, shouldering the carcass. Simon, help me haul this back. I struggled under the weight, but didn't complain. At camp, Frank set about expertly butchering and portioning the meat for smoking. My mouth watered at the rich aroma. It had been so long since a hot homemade meal. That night, over a crackling fire, we feasted on venison stew. It warmed me to my toes, the most comfort I'd felt in weeks. Across the flames, Frank watched me intently, as if weighing something. You're not so bad for a city girl, he finally said gruffly. Keep healing up and might just make it out here yet. It was the closest thing to a compliment I'd heard. I offered a small smile. Thank you, Frank, for everything. He just grunted and turned to stoke the fire. But his protection, however gruff, gave me hope that with time and care, my ankle might fully heal. And that with strength and skill, I too could survive in this new, terrifying world. Day 8 My ankle was much improved, 
barely twinging with each step now. Frank pushed our pace, eager to reach his camp before dark. The woods pressed close, draping us in cool green shadows. Birdsong was our only company as we walked in silence. I found myself watching Frank, trying to understand this enigmatic man. He moved through the forest like a ghost, making barely a sound. Every sense was attuned to our surroundings, always alert for threats. It was clear he had survived this long through hard-earned skills and street smarts. I wondered what his life was like before, what drove him to live alone in these woods. But he offered little about his past, and I knew better than to pry. Our fragile trust was based on necessity, not friendship. As the sun sank low, Frank led us to a small rise. There, that's the place. I followed his gaze to a clearing in the distance. A sturdy log cabin sat nestled against the tree line, smoke curling lazily from the chimney. Other survivors. I felt a surge of hope. Frank set a brisker pace now. As we broke from the trees, a man emerged from the cabin, rifle in hand. He lowered it at the sight of Frank. You're back, and you found another one, I see. His eyes swept me appraisingly, in a way that made me uncomfortable. Frank just grunted. This is Emma. She's healed up enough now. The man smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. Welcome, Emma. Something about his tone set my nerves on edge. But I was too tired to argue, and this was supposedly a safe place. I followed Frank inside, hoping my instincts were wrong. For now, I had no choice but to trust these men and pray their protection came without strings attached. Day 9 The cabin was sparsely furnished, but cozy, with a crackling fire and stock shelves. Frank set about cleaning his rifle as Joe showed me to a small bedroom. Get some rest. You must be tired, he said, lingering in the doorway with an unsettling smile. Supper will be ready soon. I nodded, unease curling in my gut. As he left, I barred the door and took in my new surroundings. The single bed was neatly made, a lantern and books providing the only amenities. At least it was private. I sank onto the lumpy mattress with a sigh, exhaustion pulling me into a fitful doze. Nightmares of rotting hands in the woods plagued me as always. The smell of cooking meat drew me from my room. In the main area, Frank and Joe sat eating by the fire while a stew bubbled over the flames. I took the only remaining spot as far from Joe as possible. You're looking better, girl, Frank grunted around a mouthful. Colors come back to your cheeks. I offered a small smile. Thank you for bringing me here. It's comforting being with others. Joe smiled thinly. We aim to provide safety in numbers, shelter and supplies to rebuild. Though the world has changed, basic human decency remains. His words were kind, but his eyes held a calculating gleam that set my nerves on edge. I turned back to my meal, unsettled. Night fell, and with it an eerie silence. No sounds of life stirred in the inky woods. I lay awake listening intently for any signs of the dead. But all I heard were the men's quiet voices and the crackle of the dying fire. Sleep came fitfully. Nightmares of grasping hands in the forest jolted me awake with gasps. I clutched my lantern tightly, scanning the shadows. All was still. Yet an unease lingered, a sense that unseen eyes watched from the dark. I knew not what disturbed me more the dead, or the intentions of my so-called protectors in this place. Morning light brought no reassurance. I rose stiffly, barring my door as always before venturing out. The men sat by the fire, cleaning weapons in tense silence. Something had clearly passed between them. Frank barely looked up as I entered. You sleep okay? I nodded cautiously. Is everything all right? He just grunted. Got a hunt planned today. Check the traps. You stay in. Rest that ankle. His tone brooked no argument. Joe smiled thinly. 
Don't worry, Emma. You'll be safe here with me. I'll be working on repairs. Call if you need anything. His eyes held an unsettling gleam that made my skin crawl. But with Frank leaving, I had no choice but to endure Joe's company for the day. I could only pray his protection came without unwanted advances. Time dragged as I helped with menial chores, always keeping my distance from Joe. His gaze followed my every move with unnerving intensity. By midday, my nerves were frayed. I retreated to my room gratefully, barring the door behind me. But minutes later, a knock sounded in the quiet. Emma, I've made lunch. Come eat. Suppressing a shudder, I opened the door a crack. Joe stood smiling, tray in hand. I took it wordlessly and shut the door in his face, locking it firmly. His smile faded to a scowl. The day passed slowly. Every creak of the old cabin sent my heart racing, imagining Joe's approach. Darkness fell all too soon, finding me still awake. Lantern clutched tightly as I listened for any signs of life in the woods. Distant moans carried on the night air. Drawing closer, it seemed with each passing hour. I knew not what disturbed me more in that moment, the dead outside or the intentions of the man in the next room. All I knew was that I could not stay in this place much longer. Day 10. Morning light brought no comfort, just a deepening sense of unease. I rose stiffly, barring my door as always before venturing out. The cabin was silent. The men had already left. I set about menial chores quietly, always listening for any sounds of return. But the woods remained eerily still save for birdsong. As noon passed with no sign of the men, anxiety curled in my gut. Something wasn't right. I knew I had to get away. But going back into those woods alone was suicide. Then I spotted Frank's rifle, propped by the door where he'd left it. My chance. I shouldered the pack I'd prepared in secret, taking only essentials. Frank's rifle felt heavy and unfamiliar in my hands, but it was my only protection now. Squaring my shoulders, I stepped out into the quiet forest. The trees pressed close, draping the world in cool green shadows. I picked my way carefully, always listening, watching for any movement. But the woods seemed deserted, save for birds and small animals. Still, an unseen menace lingered, raising the hairs on my neck. I knew I was being followed, stalked through these trees. By what? I couldn't say. All I knew was that I had to keep moving. Night fell swiftly under the dense canopy. I needed shelter and fast. The woods were most dangerous after dark. Then I spotted a clearing up ahead, hurrying forward. I found the remains of an old fallout shelter, long abandoned. It was small and cramped but solid, the heavy door still intact. I barred it behind me as darkness fell, sealing out the horrors of the night. Curling up in a corner, I listened intently to the sounds outside. At first, only the usual forest noises greeted my ears. Owls hooting, small animals rustling in the undergrowth. But then I heard it, a dragging, shuffling gait, and low moans carrying on the wind. They were out there. Pressing my ear to the cold metal, I counted at least a dozen shuffling silhouettes, passing slowly by my shelter. Their moans sent chills down my spine. Had they been following me all this time, I knew I couldn't stay trapped in here forever. But going out there meant facing that horde, and God knew what else was stalking these woods. As the dead continued their aimless patrol, I realized with dread that I was running out of ways to stay alive. Day 11 I must have dozed from exhaustion. When I woke, the forest was eerily silent once more. Peering through cracks in the shelter door, I saw no signs of life dead or otherwise. My stomach rumbled loudly in the quiet, reminding me that my meager supplies were dwindling. I had to find food and water, but going out meant risking that hoard again. There had to be a way to draw them away first. Then an idea came to me. I rummaged through my pack for the small mirror from my room, 
angling it to catch the morning sunlight. Beams flashed through the trees. Now I just had to wait. It didn't take long. Moans rose in the distance as the dead shuffled toward the flickering lights, drawn by some primal instinct. As their sounds faded into the trees, I slipped from the shelter and hurried in the opposite direction. The forest was eerily still once more. I picked my way carefully, always listening, watching for any movement. But the woods seemed deserted, save for birds and small animals. Still, an unseen menace lingered, raising the hairs on my neck. Then I spotted a small stream up ahead. Hurrying over, I refilled my water bottle gratefully. My stomach rumbled again. I had to find food and fast. Scanning the banks, I spotted berry bushes upriver. They were tart but satisfying, and my canteen was soon full. Feeling slightly stronger, I turned to continue my search for shelter. That's when I heard it, a low guttural growl from the shadows of the trees. My blood ran cold. Slowly, a hulking shape emerged, matted fur caked with old blood. Feral yellow eyes fixed on me hungrily. It was a wolf, long since turned feral in this new world, and it had found fresh prey. Heart pounding, I slowly backed away, keeping my eyes locked on its. Any sudden movement could trigger an attack. But then a stick cracked under my foot. With a savage snarl, it lunged. I threw myself to the side just as its jaws snapped shut where I'd been standing. Rolling to my feet, I broke into a run as its howls rose behind me. Heavy paws thundered through the undergrowth, gaining with each stride. I had to lose it, or I was dead. Ducking under low branches, I pelted through the trees as fast as my legs could carry me. But the wolf matched my every turn, hurting me relentlessly. I was tiring quickly. Up ahead, the tree line broke onto a rocky ridge. My only chance. Gathering every ounce of strength, I sprinted for the edge and launched myself into open air just as gnashing jaws closed on empty space. I hit the ground hard, rolling down a steep slope of loose shale. Rocks and branches tore at my clothes and skin until finally I crashed to a stop, dazed and bleeding at the bottom. Above, the wolf paced and snarled. Too wary to follow onto the treacherous slope, I lay there panting, every muscle screaming in protest as darkness closed in around my vision. My last thought before losing consciousness was that I may have escaped one predator, only to be left vulnerable to countless others in this new, terrifying world. Day 12 I woke to darkness, every inch of my body aching dully. For a moment I lay disoriented, remembering only fragments, the wolf, falling, crashing through the trees. Gingerly sitting up, I took stock of my injuries by lantern light. Several deep gashes bled sluggishly. My ankle was badly sprained again, but nothing felt broken, just battered and bruised. I was lucky to be alive. Rifling through my pack with shaking hands, I found bandages and painkillers barely enough to dress my wounds. The moon was high. I'd been out a long time. My canteen was also worryingly light, and I was starving. I had to find water, and fast. Using a sturdy branch as a crutch, I hauled myself unsteadily to my feet. The forest rose up the slope like an impenetrable wall in the dark. I had no choice but to follow the tree line and hope for a way out at dawn. Each step sent shooting pains through my ankle, but I gripped my teeth and pushed on. The woods were eerily silent, save for my labored breathing. No sounds of life stirred anywhere, dead or otherwise. Then I heard it, the unmistakable rush of moving water up ahead. Hope flared in my chest. I hurried toward the sound as quickly as my injuries allowed and broke through the trees onto a small riverbank. Kneeling shakily, I refilled my canteen with shaking hands. The current was swift, but the water ran clear and I had never tasted anything so sweet and refreshing. Revitalized, I turned to continue my search for shelter as dawn lightened the sky. 
That's when I heard it, a low, guttural growl from the shadows of the trees. My blood ran cold. Slowly, a hulking shape emerged, matted fur caked with old blood. Feral yellow eyes fixed on me hungrily. It was the same wolf, come to finish what it started. And I was in no state to outrun it again. Heart pounding, I slowly backed away onto the river stones, keeping my eyes locked on its. Any sudden movement could trigger an attack. This time, I had nowhere left to run. The sun was sinking below the tree line as Thomas Walker dragged himself through the swampland. His uniform was torn and caked with mud and blood, both his own and that of others. The rifle in his hands felt as heavy as lead, and his legs ached with each step through the sucking mud. He had fled the battlefield hours ago, but the horrors he witnessed still played out before his eyes. The dead rising, lurching towards the living with outstretched arms. Men screaming as they were set upon and torn apart. And the sounds, the awful, wet sounds of flesh being rent that would haunt him forever. How had it come to this? Just that morning, Thomas had stood proudly with his fellow Confederates, ready to face the Yankee invaders. But something had gone wrong, terribly wrong, when the first shots were fired. Within minutes, chaos had erupted as the fallen began to stir, reanimated by some unholy force. Thomas shook his head, trying to clear the gruesome images. He had to keep moving. The sun was sinking fast, and he dared not be caught out in the open after dark. But where could he possibly find shelter in these forsaken swamps? As he crested a small rise, a structure emerged from the gloom ahead. At first, Thomas thought it was a trick of the fading light. But as he stumbled closer, he realized it was real. An old plantation house, long abandoned to the encroaching wilderness. Hope surged in Thomas's chest. Behind those walls might lie salvation. Food, water, weapons, a barricade against the horrors of the night. New strength filled his limbs, and he hurried towards the house. Rifle at the ready. The front door hung crookedly from one hinge. Thomas nudged it open, cringing at the rusty squeal of its movement. Darkness yawned within. Hello, he called tentatively, receiving only his echo in reply. Stepping inside, Thomas's nose was assailed by the scents of dust, rot and decay. Faint light filtered in through boarded windows just enough to make out the decaying furniture and crawling vines that had reclaimed the interior. A flash of movement in the corner of his eye made Thomas spin, raising his rifle. But it was only a rat, scurrying across the warped floorboards. He let out a shaky breath and leaned against a post for support, suddenly weak. How had it come to this? Just that morning, he had stood proudly with his fellow Confederates, ready to face the Yankee invaders. But something terrible had happened on the battlefield, something that turned man against man with savage fury. Thomas remembered all too clearly the horrors he witnessed. Men and boys he had fought beside now, rising from the dead, flesh gray and eyes milky white. Their wounds, some mortal and some not, did not stop them from attacking the living with outstretched hands and snapping jaws. He had fled in panic, unable to comprehend what twisted force had reanimated the fallen. All he knew was the need to escape, to put as much distance as possible between himself and that charnel field. But had he truly escaped? As night fell, the dead would rise again, and Thomas was alone unarmed save for a single bullet in his rifle, and no clear idea of what lay ahead. Shaking off his grim thoughts, Thomas began a methodical search of the ground floor, rifle at the ready. The rooms were mostly bare, holding only remnants of former lives. A tattered dress swaying from a nail, a child's doll missing an eye. In the kitchen, Thomas found an untouched stash of canned goods and filled his haversack his stomach growling. A dusty bottle of whiskey gave him a welcome warmth as he drank, though it did little to calm his jangling nerves. As he made his way back to the front hall, Thomas froze at a creak from above. 
someone or something, was in the house with him, gripping his rifle tightly. He began to climb the stairs. The boards groaned under Thomas's boots as he ascended the staircase. With each step, his heart pounded louder in his ears. At the top was a long hallway, stretching into shadow. Thomas raised his rifle and edged forward. The first door on his right hung ajar. Thomas kicked it open and swept inside, rifle leveled. Moonlight filtered through grimy windows, illuminating a musty bedroom. Dusty sheets clung to an ornate four-poster bed like a ghost. Thomas scanned every corner but found nothing. He moved on, checking each room with mounting dread. Empty bedrooms and a nursery, its crib long overturned. In the last room at the end of the hall, Thomas froze. A shape shifted in the darkness by the window. Don't move, Thomas rasped, thumbing back the rifle hammer with an audible click. Slowly, a gaunt figure turned to face him. Thomas stifled a gasp. It was a man, or what remained of one. His uniform was tattered gray rags hanging from bone. Skin clung limply to his skull in gray tatters. But it was the eyes that held Thomas paralyzed. Milky white orbs that seemed to stare right through him. A guttural moan issued from the creature's jaws. It shambled forward with outstretched hands, nails black and curled. Thomas fired on instinct. The shot punched a bloody hole in its chest, but it continued implacably forward. Thomas backed away in horror. More moans echoed up the staircase. Thomas turned and sprinted back the way he came, the dead Confederate lurching after him. He leapt down the steps three at a time, nearly losing his footing. At the bottom, the hallway seethed with shadows shifting back and forth. Thomas froze, scanning frantically. Then he saw them, emerging from every door like figures from a nightmare, men and women in tattered clothes some missing limbs, others mere crawling torsos, but all shared those same milky eyes and grasping hands. The horde closed in from both sides. Thomas took aim and fired, blasting one through the skull. Its body crumpled, but the others continued shambling forward, uncaring. He was trapped between the dead above and below with no escape. A crash of splintering wood made Thomas spin. The front door had caved in under the weight of bodies piling against it from outside. Through the breach shuffled more reanimated corpses, drawn by the gunshot. The plantation house was overrun. Thomas backed down the hall, reloading frantically as the dead pressed in. His boot struck something, and he glanced down to see a trapdoor. Throwing it open revealed a musty cellar, his only chance for a temporary refuge. Thomas dropped inside just as grasping hands closed around his ankle. He kicked free and slammed the trap shut, plunging into inky darkness. Heavy thuds and scrapes sounded from above as dozens of corpses piled onto the thin wooden barrier. Thomas fumbled for his matches with shaking hands and lit an oil lamp. The flickering glow revealed old wine racks and barrels in the earthen room. A small tunnel led off into blackness. Thomas had escaped the horde for now, but he was trapped underground with no way out and only a single bullet left in his rifle. Worse still, he had heard shouts in the distance as darkness fell. The vengeful Yankee soldiers were closing in. By dawn, Thomas would learn the true meaning of being prey, as both the living and dead hunted him relentlessly through these haunted swamplands. For now, all he could do was retreat deeper into the earth and pray that by some miracle, he might find a way to survive the night. Lucas wiped the sweat from his brow as he surveyed the field. The corn stalks were withering earlier than usual, leaves yellowing under the hot sun. Another poor harvest was on the horizon. He turned at the sound of shuffling footsteps to see three zombies approaching guided by control chips implanted at the base of their skulls. Gray's workers, as he called them. Lucas still wasn't comfortable around the reanimated corpses, but they provided much, needed labor as other farms had failed. The zombies set to work weeding without complaint. Their dull eyes betrayed no emotion, 
faces locked in a perpetual grimace of death. Lucas tried not to think about their past lives as the zombies plowed on mindlessly. At least the control chips kept them docile, for now. As the sun sank low, Lucas headed back to the farmhouse. His daughter Emily ran out to greet him, her smile a rare light in these dark times. Papa, can we have stew tonight? She asked hopefully. Lucas' heart sank at the thought of their dwindling supplies. We'll see what your mother says, sweetheart. Inside, Sarah tended the fire, her worn face etched with concern. The corn isn't looking good, Lucas reported grimly. Sarah sighed. We'll manage. At least the zombies help with chores. Still, Lucas detected a hint of unease in her voice regarding their workers. That night, as Lucas tried to sleep, faint screams pierced the darkness. He shot up, heart pounding, and rushed to the window. In the distance, lights flickered at Gray's compound on the hill. What new horrors was the enigmatic man conducting under cover of night? The next morning, Lucas questioned Gray. We heard noises last night. Everything, all right? Gray smiled coldly. Just testing some equipment. Nothing to worry your simple farmer mind over. Lucas didn't believe him for a second, but said nothing more. He needed this job too badly for Emily and Sarah's sake. That afternoon, one of the zombies lurched towards Emily as she played, reaching out with rotting hands. Lucas leapt into action, tackling the zombie before it could grab her. He wrestled it to the ground, noticing strange discoloration around its control chip. Had Gray been tampering with them? Over the next few days, Lucas observed odd behavior in the zombies. One stumbled as if drunk, Another growled and snapped at the chickens. Their control seemed to be slipping. Lucas grew more certain something sinister was afoot at Gray's compound, and he was determined to find out what. But with supplies dwindling and winter coming, he had little choice but to continue working for the enigmatic man, at least for now. Something had to be done before Gray's secrets put them all in danger. But what could a simple farmer do against such unknown evils? The zombies shuffled through the field as dusk fell, guided by their control chips to return to Gray's compound for the night. Lucas watched them go, his suspicions stronger than ever after the incident with Emily. Once the last shambling form disappeared into the trees, he grabbed his shotgun and set off into the gathering gloom. Lucas crept through the forest, senses on high alert for any sign of Gray's patrols. A chill wind whispered through the pines as pale moonlight filtered down, casting the landscape in an eerie glow. He slowed as the compound came into view, barbed wire fences and watchtowers looming against the night sky. Voices drifted over the fence, men laughing raucously. An illegal fight must be underway. Lucas circled stealthily, scanning for an opening. There, a section of fence had collapsed the barbed wire hanging loose. He squeezed through and dropped low, darting from shadow to shadow. The source of the noise soon became clear. A makeshift arena had been constructed inside the largest building. Dozens of men cheered and placed bets as two zombies dueled savagely within the chain link cage. Their control chips had been removed, reducing them to feral beasts driven solely by bloodlust. Lucas watched in horror, stomach churning. These were people once. How could Gray treat them with such callous disregard? A door opened nearby, and Lucas ducked behind some crates. Peering out, Gray emerged, dragging a struggling zombie behind him. Its skull cracked open to expose the pulsing control chip. This one's aggression levels are too low still, Gray muttered to his assistant. He produced a vial of cloudy liquid. A few drops of this new formula should do the trick. Lucas stifled a gasp. So the rumors were true. Gray had been experimenting on his zombies, tampering with their chips. A scream rent the air as one combatant tore the other's arm off. The crowd roared with glee, lost in a frenzy of bloodlust. Lucas knew he had to get out, had to warn the others. But as he turned to leave, a boot connected with his ribs, sending him sprawling. Through watering eyes, 
he saw Gray's cold smile loom over him. Well, well, a little mouse has found its way into my maze. I think it's time we had a little chat. Gray's men hauled Lucas to his feet, binding his hands tightly. There would be no reasoning with this madman. Lucas could only pray he would survive long enough to escape and shut Gray down before the town was overrun by his monstrous creations.